Well, hello, Christ Chapel. Thank you for joining us today. If no one has told you lately, there's two things I wanna tell you. First, you are loved. I promise you, we love you as a church. The second thing is, wash your hands. You need to wash your hands. Everybody's telling you that these days. And I'm gonna ask you to do something with those hands to turn to Matthew chapter 14. If you're opening one of your own Bibles, you obviously know where that is. Um, If you're opening one of the uh, cyber Bibles, you can turn to, on my phone, I use the YouVersion uh, Bible. You can use Bible Gateway on the computer. Also, download our app because all of the scriptures are downloaded on our application on the CCBC app, and it'll show you everything we're gonna be studying today as well as have the notes that you can go through as well. Uh, If I told you that we were living in unprecedented times, you would probably tell me that that is an understatement, and that's true. I mean, who would have ever imagined that a bundle of toilet paper would be as valuable as a barrel of oil? Nobody. We, we, we couldn't even comprehend that a time like that would ever come. In fact, our world is experiencing something that we haven't even seen since the Spanish flu in about 1918. Uh, never before have we encountered during our lifetime the social, the, the economic implications that are going on in our world right now. We, we just, these are unprecedented times. And in the uncertainty that we are all facing, what I find people oftentimes want are answers. They, they want answers. They want to know, when will this end? When will my kids go back to school? What's going to happen with my job? When will the stock market stop falling? Everybody wants answers, and I'll be honest with you, I don't have those answers. I wish that I did. I wish that I could tell you the answers to all of your questions. But here's what I do know. When we're facing uncertain times and we need those answers and we can't get them, what we really need is an anchor, an anchor for our souls. And where we need to anchor our hope, where we need to anchor our hearts, and where we need to anchor our minds is in God's word. And that's what we're gonna do today. We're gonna look at a scripture that shows us that God can use unprecedented times to call out unprecedented faith because I believe that is what God is calling us to as a church. And I wanna look at an unprecedented situation that happened to some of Jesus' disciples and how they responded because what I think you're gonna see is that God is in control And he's calling us to places that we've never been, but he's gonna support us to places that he wants us to go. So we're gonna look at Matthew chapter 14 today. We're gonna take a break from our series, The Seven Words from the Cross. We're gonna pick back up with that series next week, but uh, for today, we're gonna obviously study something a little bit different. Because as I said, God will work during unprecedented times to call us to unprecedented faith. During these unprecedented times, he's gonna call us to exercise faith that that probably reaches to depths that you've never been to before. And you know what, to be honest, that really excites me. And we're gonna look at this from Matthew chapter 14, and I wanna give you a little bit of context before we jump into verses 22 to 33. Because right before verse 22, what has been going on is Jesus is on the hillside with his disciples. And they've just experienced this miracle that Jesus has performed where he has fed 5,000 people. I mean, this is the high of all highs. If you wanna relate it to today, uh, this is a bull market. Everything is going well. Everybody is fat and happy. And then Jesus is going to send his disciples someplace different. And it's gonna go from a bull market to a bear market, a very scary time. And Jesus is going to allow a situation in the disciples' lives that was beyond their control. Look at Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 to 24. It says, immediately, right after the feeding of the 5,000, he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. While he dismissed the crowds, these were the crowds that he had fed, And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when evening came, he was there alone. 
But the boat by this time was long away from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. So Jesus, after this wonderful time that he shared with his disciples, where he showed him his power, the power that he had to perform miracles, sends his disciples off in a boat on the Sea of Galilee. And it says that he goes up by himself alone to pray. And then they are in the middle of the Sea of Galilee, buffeted this boat by waves and wind. And you know, what struck me in these couple of verses is that this is a situation that the disciples couldn't control. They had no control over the wind. They had no control over the waves. And I know you probably can relate to that feeling, feeling like you can't control the situation right now. You're trying to grab hold of everything that you can, but it just seems like every day you grab hold of something, circumstances change again. The circumstances are outside of our control, but here's what I want you to remember, is that you're not alone. You are in the same boat with us. We are all in this together. Because what strikes me when I read those two verses is that the only person that is alone is Jesus. The disciples aren't alone. They're together. And we're in the same boat, Christ Chapel, and we are gonna get through this together. We're living it together and we're gonna get through it together. Because what is gonna get us through is understanding that Jesus has never lost sight of us. See, Jesus never lost sight of where his disciples were or what they were going through. He knew exactly where they were. He knew exactly what they were going through because of the perspective that he had as he sat on the mountaintop. Look at verses 25 to 26. It says, and in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and they said, it is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. I think we can all relate to this crying out in fear. You know, when they went out on this boat, a couple of these guys were very experienced fishermen. They had experienced waves before. They had experienced storms before. But something about this was unprecedented. Certainly, it was unprecedented when Jesus begins to walk on the water toward them. And it says they cry out in fear. And I want you to know, man, my heart bleeds for you that are cry- you're crying out in fear. You don't know what's coming and you don't know what is happening. But what I want you to know is Jesus is coming for you. You see, I think Jesus comes to the disciples out of compassion. He knows that they're afraid. He knows that they're experiencing a storm that they had never seen before. And we're experiencing the same kind of unprecedented storm. And Jesus comes to us in the midst of the storm out of compassion. But he also comes not just out of compassion, but he comes amidst the chaos to calm their fears and to bolster their courage. If you look at Matthew chapter 14, verses 27 and 28, It says, but immediately, immediately, as they cry out in fear, Jesus enters into the situation. And Jesus spoke to them saying, take heart. It is I, it's it's me, it's Jesus, the one who loves you. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. You know, I love what Jesus says when he comes to the disciples in the midst of this chaotic storm. He says two things. The first I I, I want to to highlight is when he says, don't be afraid. It's me. It's Jesus. Jesus wants you to know that you don't have to be afraid, that he can make the, the winds and the waves cease, that he is a refuge during the storm, and you can take refuge in him. His presence creates peace, and that's why we need to continue to seek his presence during this time. But the second thing that he says, I love, and honestly, I've skimmed over this part of of what he says to the disciples for many years until I studied this passage this past week. He says, take heart, take heart. When he says take heart, what he means is cheer up, Uh, take courage, Have, have hope, don't be afraid. You know, I think that's what Jesus is telling them because he is gonna call them during this unprecedented storm to take an unprecedented step of faith. And it's gonna take courage. 
It's gonna take confidence in the presence of God and his calling on our lives in order to take that step. And that's why he says, take heart. Christ Chapel, it's time to take heart. We don't have to be afraid because Jesus is coming to us in the midst of the storm, but he's gonna call us to an unprecedented step of faith, just like he called Peter. You see, because Jesus, right in the next verses, in verse 29, Jesus called Peter to exercise extraordinary faith. In verse 29, after Peter says, if it's really you, Lord, then, then, then call me out. Give me a call to come to you. And Jesus said, come. And so Peter got out of the boat and he walked on the water and he came to Jesus. We don't know of anyone else throughout history other than Jesus that has walked on water other than Peter. And you go, what an amazing step of faith. You see, what I've realized is oftentimes we would love to talk about these extraordinary times with Jesus when we are walking with him on the water, but we have to take heart. And we have to have confidence in what God is calling us out to, not focused on the winds or the waves, but fixing our eyes on him and walking toward what he has for us in order to have these kind of experiences. Because these are the kind of things that God is calling us to, these extraordinary steps of faith. Now is the time that we take those. You see, Christ Chapel, God is calling us to exercise unprecedented faith during this unprecedented time. It's gonna take unprecedented faith during this unprecedented time, and that is what God is calling us to do. He's telling us, don't be afraid. I've got you. I am holding you. I see you. I know what you're going through, so don't be afraid. And guess what? Take heart. Take heart, have courage, have confidence in me. Step toward me, come closer to me. He is calling us to have an experience with with him like we've never had before. To step into unknown and uncharted waters. He's calling us to go places that we've never gone before. And that's exciting. That's exciting to know what he is calling us to and to think about, at least for me, to dream of the things and the stories that we're gonna have as we step toward him of, wow, look what God did. That, that, that's amazing. And I can't wait to take those steps of faith with you. But what it's gonna require us to have is unprecedented faith. And so what I wanna do is, I wanna tell you some of these things, some of these elements that are gonna be required for this unprecedented faith. And it's gonna cause us to to draw closer to Jesus and to draw closer to one another as a church because, church, this is the time that God has called us to step out. This is the time. He has made us for such a time as this. This is not time to shrink back. This is time to step out. And I wanna tell you how we can step out in unprecedented faith in the three very simple ways. First, Unprecedented faith calls for unprecedented commitments. Unprecedented faith calls for unprecedented commitments. You know, one of the things I've realized with this crisis that our world is going through is crises always provide clarity. Crises always provide clarity. When we're going through a crisis, we oftentimes, we, we, we cut the fluff we find out what's most important and we prioritize those things that, that are most important to us in our lives. Somebody texted me the other day and just said, Cody, how are you doing? And I said, praise God, I'm doing well. God is good and my family is good. Like, those are the two things that are most important to me. My relationship with God and, and my family and obviously my church family. And you know what? All is well. Those are my priorities. In the midst of crisis, which provides clarity on the things that are most important. And you know, what I've been praying is through this crisis that God would make clear to you that the most important thing is your relationship with him. That God can use this whole thing that's going on in the globe to draw people closer to himself. I mean, that's what he tells us in Romans 8, 28. He says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. 
that God can use this to clarify the commitments that we need to make to him, to clarify the commitments that we need to make to our family. Today is the day for you to clarify those commitments and make those commitments to the Lord. In fact, Christ Chapel, what I would love for you to do is to commit your life to Christ. If you've never done that before, now's the day to begin a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus came to this earth to live a perfect and sinless life and to give his life on the cross to pay the penalty for your sins. And if you would place your trust, if you would believe that he did that to pay for your sins and then he rose from the dead to pay for your sins, that you can have a relationship with Christ, an eternal relationship with him, one that will never end, that no matter what happens in this temporal life, that you will have eternal and everlasting life in him. Today's the day to make that commitment to him. That's unprecedented for some of you. You've never made that commitment before, but today is the day. And others of you need to make different kind of commitments, but here's one that I want all of us to make as a family, Christ Chapel. I want us to commit to spend time daily with Jesus so you can rest in his character. Would you spend time daily with Jesus so that you can rest in his character? You need to know the promises of God. You need to know who God is and who he says that he is and who he says you are. All of those promises come from his word, who we know him to be. Would you commit to spend time with him daily in his word? If you would do that, here, here's where I would like for you to make that commitment. Not just to you and the Lord, but Christ Chapel family. Would you do this together? Would you go online? There's a place where you can go online and fill out a commitment card where you will commit to read his word daily, to worship together, to commit yourself to these things as a family so that we can continue in our spiritual growth together. I think it's great to make that commitment public and I'll be the first to sign that commitment card online and I hope that you would do the same. Because by making those commitments, we'll keep each other accountable, but we'll ultimately grow in what we understand God's promises to be. Because let me tell you why that's important. Because there's a difference between understanding God's promises and the platitudes that are being thrown around on social media. There's no peace or rest in platitudes. Platitudes are things we throw around. Promises, God's promises, are things we hold on to. It's, it, it's what we can rest our souls on. It's what we can cling to during these times. And that's why you need to know it. And that's why I want you to commit to it. So unprecedented faith requires unprecedented commitments. And now is the time for us to make those as a family, Christ Chapel. But second, unprecedented faith also calls for unprecedented connection. Unprecedented connection. Now more than ever, it's important that we do not remain isolated, but we find creative ways to connect. I know the phrase that's being thrown around these days is social distancing, and that is certainly wise and prudent. But social distancing does not mean spiritual distancing. We do not need to remain spiritually distant from other believers in Christ, especially the family of Christ Chapel. This is a time for us to draw close to one another and not be isolated spiritually because I'll tell you, one of the things that I'm afraid of is that some of you are going to isolate yourself spiritually and you're gonna fall to temptations or old habits or back into addictions. Things that you had once said, man, by God's grace and with the help of the family of God, I've overcome that. I've gotten past that. But now we have the temptation to remain isolated and not have the accountability around us and we'll fall prey to those things and I don't want that for you. Now is not the time for that to happen which is why we need to lean in to those connections. We need to lean into the family of God in unprecedented ways. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 24 says, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Would you consider that? Would you think of ways that you can encourage your Christian brother or sister, encourage family members to grow in their faith, to connect with them in creative ways? 
See, what we need to do is create new patterns to connect with other Christians. We're gonna have to create new patterns. We don't have the old traditions or the old habits of gathering together in large groups at this very time. So let's create new creative ways. That's not gonna stop us gathering face-to-face from growing in Christ. And we have a lot of groups that you can be a part of online. You can join an internet campus group right now. You can join our our home group that are meeting online as well, where they're gonna study the sermons that we're gonna be going through and talking about how those apply to their lives. Or ladies, you can join a Women in the Word group online. Right now, they're studying the book of Revelation. I think that's super interesting for these times. You'll want to study that. And guys, you're studying the book of Judges. You can join that men's study online as well. It's great to show the the difference between kings that trusted in God and kings who didn't trust in God and the contrast of the the outcomes of their life. These are ways that you can get connected immediately. But here's one step that I want all of us to take right now. Right now, no matter where you are, would you pull out your phones and text CCBC family to 555-888? Because this is going to allow us to be able to connect with you more immediately than, than through email or any other form of communication. And so if you'll pull that out, we can together stay connected as a family and communicate quickly and urgently if we need to. So we want to connect with you in creative ways. And if you'll text that now, we promise we'll remain connected to you. So create new patterns to connect with other believers. And then finally, unprecedented faith is gonna call for unprecedented sacrifice. It's gonna call for unprecedented sacrifice. You know, over the past few weeks, I've noticed the human tendency for everybody to take care of themselves. And and, and I'll admit, selfishly, I've had those same thoughts, that I need to take care of myself. And to be honest, I confess that as sin because what we need to do is consider others. This is time for us to step out and consider how we can sacrifice things of, of ourselves for others who are in need. You know, as I was reading this past week, I was reading the story of the bubonic plague and the black plague that were thousands of years ago. But at that very time, people were struggling. Millions of people were were dying and they didn't know the the cause at, at the time. And so because they didn't know the cause, because they didn't have those answers, many people just pulled away from all of those who were sick Uh, City governments left people alone. They moved out of the city and isolated themselves. There was no one to take care of those people who were hurting. But Christians stepped in. Christians stepped in. They sacrificed their own well-being to step in and take care of those who are sick. It left such an impression that some historians say that may be what converted the Roman Empire to Christianity. This extreme sacrifice, this extreme compassion. And honestly, isn't that what drew us to Christ in the first place? That, he, that God loved us so much that he sacrificed his only son so that through him we shouldn't perish but have eternal life. Sacrifice is what draws us to God. And sacrifice is gonna speak the loudest to our world who desperately needs the church. Now, I want you to be wise I don't want you to uh, not be prudent or think about the the things that that you're going through in order to sacrifice for other needs, but to step into those. But here's what we need to do, church. We need to support the needs of others while you trust God to care for your own. Support the needs of others while you trust God to care for your own. You know, if we really do sing and if we really do say that we believe God is in control, then we have to live like that. We have to live like he's got us in the palm of his hand. We have to live like he knows the circumstances that we're going through and he will take care of us. And therefore, because we know that if we seek his kingdom first, as Matthew 6, says, that he will take care of all of our other needs, that we commit ourselves to that and we'll sacrifice our own needs, trusting that God will take care of those and move toward the needs of others, and I want you to do that in two very specific ways. First, I want you to go invest in your neighbors. 
Invest in your neighbors. What if I had this, this dream this, this, this past week as I was just imagining what could happen? And I dreamed if every one of us won our neighbors, meaning if we would go reach out to them and take the initiative, what if you wrote a note to every one of your neighbors, everyone in relative proximity to where you're staying, and you wrote a note to them and you just said, hey, my name's Cody. Obviously, your name isn't probably. My name's Cody, and I wanted you to know that I'm praying for you. Here's my phone number, and here's my email address. If there's anything I can do for you, please contact me. And just leave it on their doorstep. Put it in, you know, leave it in a place where they're gonna get it. And then see the response. And pray for your neighbors. Don't, don't, don't tell them you're gonna do something that you're not doing. Literally, do it. What kind of community would that build? What kind of sacrifice would that require, but what kind of statement would that make for Jesus as we invest in others who might need help as we trust God to take care of our own needs? And then the second way that I want you to invest is I, I want you to invest your resources into the church. Uh, Christ Chapel, you are an incredibly generous church, the most generous church I have ever heard of. In fact, so much so that if you didn't hear just a couple weeks ago when we asked you to give to the famine relief in Kenya because of the locusts that had come through after the drought that has wiped out the food supplies in that country, you gave $51,000 to provide food for those families. You're incredibly generous, and I'm so thankful for that. And Christ Chapel, I need you to continue to be that wonderful church. And here's why. Because benevolence needs are spiking in our community. And we have a process where we are vetting those needs and helping those in and around our community who need help the most. This is time for us to step up and step into those folks. This reminds me of 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 to 3, when Paul is recounting to the church in Corinth. And he says, we want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. He says, here's what was going on in the churches of Macedonia. He says, for in a severe test of affliction, it was going through an unprecedented time of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. That even though they were experiencing affliction and poverty, they were generous. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord. Christ Chapel, I'm gonna ask you to commit to giving according to your means. I know that many of you are suffering right now financially and you, you don't know what to do, but I'm telling you, this is not the time to shrink back. This is the time to step up. And so what I'm gonna ask you to do is I'm gonna ask you to text uh, on your screen. I'm gonna ask you to text to 77977 and text to CCBC and then the campus that you're a part of. And I'm gonna ask you to set up a reoccurring gift on there. Uh, some of you have a reoccurring gift and honestly, the majority of you do. Uh, the majority of Christ Chapelites give online and I'm so thankful for that because that cuts down on our back office costs. And it helps us deploy more dollars to those folks who need it most. Because folks in our city are hurting. In fact, we support a lot of nonprofits in our city who need help right now. We, this is not the time where we need ministries to shrink and shrivel. This is time when we need those ministries to step up. And if everybody gives a little, that little is gonna go a long way because we're in this together, Christ Chapel. We're, we're in the same boat and God sees us and God knows us and he's stepping toward us, but he's calling us out in faith in this unprecedented time. And I wanted to remind you of an unprecedented time that our church has faced before. Certainly, it was nothing like what's going on in our world with the coronavirus, but Christ Chapel family, you'd be very familiar with this. Because if you'll remember, just a year ago, we went through a major transition, a transition that our church has never seen before, where our senior pastor, Ted Kitchens, transitioned that role to me as now the lead pastor. And honestly, none of us knew how it was gonna go. It was uncharted waters. Our church has never seen a transition like that. And what Ted challenged the church to do was to step up. And you did that. You stepped up in a huge way. 
You stepped up your commitment to one another. You stepped up the commitment to the community. You stepped up your commitment financially. And we've been able to do unprecedented things this past year because we're in this together. Crest Chapel, when people asked me last year during the transition, I remember people saying, Cody, how are you gonna do it? How are you gonna step into that role? I mean, this is, this is a big church. This is a big responsibility. Ted has big shoes to fill, and absolutely he does. And I remember telling people all the time, I can't do it. There's no way I can do it. But we can. We can do this. We can do this together. And that's what we have to remember, Christ Chapel, is that we are in this and we are gonna step toward the unprecedented steps of faith that God is calling us to in these unprecedented times. And we're gonna step into them in such a way that we're going to meet Jesus. And you know what? We're gonna meet Jesus in such a way just like the disciples did at the end of that account. It says, when they all got in the boat together, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshiped him saying, truly, you are the son of God. That's how I wanna step into this unprecedented time, church. I wanna step into it in such a way that when this whole thing ceases, because it will end, that we can all step into it together and not only fix our eyes on Jesus, but we can join with those who have made recent commitments to Christ, new Christ chapelites, new family members, and we can all look to him and say, truly, you are the son of God. Would you pray with me, please? Well, God, I'm thankful, so thankful that you love us and you've never lost sight of us. You've never let us down. And I thank you that you are calling us to take these unprecedented steps of faith and you're gonna help us walk toward you. And even if we stumble and even if we fall, you're still there to save us. But we're in this together. Lord God, may you take us to places we've never been before. May you take us deeper than we've ever been before to see you in ways that we've never seen before so that we can worship you and say, truly, you are the Son of God. You deserve all of our worship and we give it to you now. In Jesus' name, amen.